afternoon. Steve and Ann, thank you for the invitation. Um, so unlike my, I think my previous co-speakers uh, really set the stage. Uh, this is slightly different. There's not as much follow-up and long-term data for this as uh, after fundification. These are my disclosures of which Torex Medical is the most important one. I showed this slide yesterday. This device has now been around for five years, uh, released in 2012 in the United States. And with pretty balanced outcomes, I showed this slide again yesterday, but the focus today is really on that left side, to talk about dysphagia rates, erosions, and uh, reoperative interventions in terms of uh, how do these mechanisms uh, for links manage to fail over time. We know that 75% of patients who have a Lynx device will have good to excellent outcomes, but in that 25% category that don't, uh, what are the issues? And if you look at uh, several different studies, this is uh, C. Dan Smith's paper looking at the MOD database. The MOD database is a manufacturer's database for, with voluntarily reported, uh, uh, poor or reported problems with the device that uh, Torex is required to submit to, and uh, you can see the variety of, uh, of things that have occurred over time in the 3,283 patients. Uh, Lynx devices were removed for abdominal pain, but most commonly dysphagia, and most commonly dysphagia in the first year after the device is implanted. Erosions down here, reflux being the second most common reason for referral. A category of other which I have no idea is, some people had to have an MRI, somebody would be able to have retracted vomiting, but a 2.7% explant rate in the MOD database, which may be underreported, but 57% of patients at one year uh, having their device removed. So most commonly, if you're going to have a device removal, it's usually in the first year after device implantation. A different look at it, this is the, um, this is the five year uh, outcome database for, for links, uh, dysphagia being the most common reason for removal in, in the 100 patient pivotal trial with a 7% explant rate, much different than the MOD database, no erosions in this trial. And then if you look at Luigi Bonavina's paper that was just published in the Annals of Surgery last year, 164 patients, this is a single institution series uh, with, a, again, about a 7% explant rate, two erosions. Um, but here now, dysphagia is not the most common reason for explantation. It's really recurrent GERD is the most common reason for explantation in his series. But they did an interesting regression analysis, and the reason for removal was supine reflux. If you had supine reflux after you had your links persistently, that would lead to the reason for, for the likelihood of removal. So the explantation rate really is somewhere between 3 and 7 percent in most of these series. In Dr. Bonavina's paper, again, the recommended or the likelihood of removal was under two years, so most of these all coming out within two years. Then once you reach that point, it looks like things remain stable. They recommended reevaluation, much like Dr. Catan outlined, if symptoms persist or there's de novo symptoms at six months, and there's the standard, the standard, uh, the standard evaluation, barium swallow, manometry, and endoscopy with or without a pH test. Let's look a little closer at some of these symptoms. Well, dysphagia is most common. This is one of the most common symptoms reported in, in the post-approval study, which was done after the, the, uh, is after the FDA mandated trial. The FDA mandated Torax completed an additional 200 patient trial. This was just accepted to annals last week. There were 200 patients in this trial. 82 percent of those, 82 of those patients had no dysphagia preoperatively and 36% of them developed new onset dysphagia at 12-month follow-up for a rate of about 37%. This is the breakdown based on the uh, GERD H. Carell. Uh, noticeable once a day, noticed, bothersome, really bothersome, and then daily, affects my daily living. But so most dysphagia pretty mild in, in, this, in, this, day, in this set of patients. Dilation was required in 13 out of the 30 patients with symptomatic resolution in 77% of those particular patients uh, and ongoing symptoms of dysphagia in 13. When you look carefully at this dysphagia in this, it's usually bimodal. There's early postoperative dysphagia, which, uh, as we've learned with implanting Lynx devices, occurs typically around day 10 to 14, and is thought to be really related to encapsulation of the device, the scarring that occurs. This is usually very self-limiting. Uh, I think most Lynx surgeons are now using sort of a, a rehab sort of dietary protocol with frequent solid food bolus meals uh, at about an hour uh, at a time. And in refractory cases, short course steroids have been recommended and, and seem to help without any particular data behind them. And in most people, that resolves. And, and dilation is rarely required early on in the process. 
Patients with persistent dysphagia, at least in my experience, a lot of it's solid food. And, uh, and one of the questions I always ask is, well, how fast do you eat? Are you trying to swallow the burger in two minutes like you used to? Because that's not going to work with a Lynx device. And often what happens is when you slow them down, uh, most of the dysphagia actually resolves. And so a, a lot of that is talking to your patient. And if after slowing them down, they still have persistent dysphagia, I think that's when I, I would pull out dilation. And dilation, at least in, in our hands at Swedish, is actually very uncommon. And uh, certainly keep in mind that further evaluation at this point in time, when they've had it for six months or more, is, is probably going to be necessary. The issue of new onset dysphagia, I think, definitely requires evaluation. If you've been fine for six, 12, 13 months and you show up with new onset dysphagia, I think that sort of mandates an evaluation with links. And lately, I've moved to simply getting a chest x-ray because that's actually been helpful to demonstrate where the position of the links is. I get an x-ray after I put the links in so I know where it is when I've, uh, when I've operated on them. And this is, this is the one erosion that we can claim from Swedish uh, in our series here that uh, presented with new onset dysphagia. As you can imagine, the data for erosions is a little all over the place because people report them, some people don't report them. This is data from Dan Smith's paper in the MOD database along with Dr. Bonavina's paper. Uh, and, and you can see here, what did people present with? Erosions almost always presented with dysphagia of some sort. Uh, device size, as you know, the 12B device was available, has been taken off the market largely because of these erosions, 12, 12, 12, four of them in the early in this in this data set, and, and most of them occurring within within the 20 more 24 month period, except for uh, ours at Swedish, which occurred at three years. Um, current recommendations, both from Torax and from most of the link surgeons, is for two different techniques for removal. There is a two stage uh, procedure which some people are using with an endoscopic division of the uh, of the device removal of whatever beads are exposed. And then downstream, once mucosal healing has occurred, a subsequent laparoscopic removal of the remaining beads, uh, and, uh, and likely, in some cases, a concomitant anti-reflux procedure, in some cases for dysphagia. I know that some folks are just taking the beads out and leaving people alone. And then there's the one-stage endoscopic <laughs> removal of all beads, uh, which uh, sometimes, I think, lessens the need for TPN, and then you can plan your anti-reflux surgery downstream as you need it, uh, if it's absolutely necessary. What about GERD after anti-reflux surgery? Well, the current data f out of the PAS trial, which has uh, demonstrated really the best normalization rate of the, of the percent time pH at 74 and the normalized Demeester score at 72.4, uh, really sort of sets, a, I think, the current bar uh, in, in a large series. With that, with that number of about 75% of patients with good control of the GERD, that means that, you know, in that 200 patient series, we would expect about 55 or 27 and half percent of patients who have a positive pH test. But interestingly in this study, only about 12% of those patients are actually on a PPI. So there's some disconnect between pH positive reflux and whether patients are experiencing symptoms after a Lynx device or if it's just simply we've reduced the reflux well enough that they've got better clearance. I'm not really sure. In those 25 patients who are on a PPI, about a third of them take it PRN, about close to half take it once a day, and then a smaller portion are taking BID PPIs. Well, what are the reasons for that? I showed this yesterday. I, th I think the inability to restore all LES characteristics, I think, is one of the risk factors for having a, uh, a ongoing leakage of acid reflux disease, and, and I think that's potentially one of the problems, that if you cannot restore all those defects, you're likely or maybe prone to developing GERD. We also know uh, data shown by John Lippum at this, uh, at this meeting earlier this week, as well as a paper that we're going to present at DDW later, that the crew closure and how we address the hiatus is going to be increasingly important. And with complete dissection and uh, restoration of length, followed by crew closure and implantation of the links, you really get a much better uh, chance of uh, achieving a normalized Demeester score when you, uh, when you achieve that. But, what about these people who had the minimal dissection, the original implantation technique? Well, this is a patient of mine who uh, was just in recently for uh, their ongoing follow-up, and, and we went back and looked at all of his endoscopy reports, and you can see in 2016, a year after his device was implanted, it looked pretty good, and there's the device there, the, it's closed. Demeester scores were 1 and uh, 10. 2017, all of a sudden, he's complaining a little bit of heartburn. The, the valve doesn't quite look as good. Uh, Demeester score was 11 and 27. 
And then this past uh, month, he comes back and he's now got Demetrius scores of 44 and 73. And you can see that this hiatus looks nothing like the hiatus that was there before. And so it's probably likely that some of these early implantations will undergo deterioration of the hiatus over time and, and likely require something downstream. So we've placed him on PPIs and we're going to try to figure out what we're going to do for him in the next little while. And so I, I think, you know, for the post management of GERD, I think both my previous uh, co-presenters said the same thing, which is, you know, I, we put them on PPIs, see how they do. Uh, if most of them can be managed with PRN, PPIs, or Zantac, then I'm happy. Uh, if they get daily, then some people are happy. What I've discovered is most people won't give up their links. They're not really interested in taking their links out. They'll manage themselves with a combination of PPIs, and only in the patients who are on twice a day PPI, still uncontrolled, will they go for a repeat uh, or removal of the device and a conversion. Uh, and as, as the indications get extended, we are likely to see some of these occurring, uh, transmediastinal herniation. This is a, a, a patient that uh, came to see me in follow-up after having a large hiatal hernia repair repaired by a surgeon south of the city uh, with complaints of heartburn and dysphagia and, and an x-ray that was this and the gastroenterologist wondering what we should do. This is the endoscopy pictures on this, uh, this elderly woman uh, and I, we haven't really done her a service uh, at this point in time. Um, this data yesterday uh, I showed as well in, in Dr. Bell and Buckley's paper, uh, about an 8% recurrence at a between 6 and 12 month follow-up of uh, large parasophageal hernia repairs. But coincidentally, Dr. Oschlager's study uh, at about 6 months had an 8% recurrence rate. So I, I think what will happen downstream I think is, is uh, yet to unfold, but uh, I'm hoping that's, that this number is less, but uh, we'll see what time evolves. The options, if you get transmediastinal herniation, uh, I think are one of three. Redo the hiatal hernia repair, leave the, M, leave the device intact, redo the hiatal hernia repair, convert it to a Nissen, redo the hiatal hernia repair. Some people have talked about reciting the, the magnetic sphincter if it's not in the correct position. Uh, I don't think there's any particular data which one of these work better than the others. A lot of this is anecdotal based on uh, talking to other link surgeons who have, uh, have tackled these. A couple of rare things that have happened. This is a patient of mine who had no dysphagia up front, uh, who immediately in the recovery room began having waves of spasm and uh, had normal motility up front. And over the course of a week, she went from having an esophagogram where everything emptied to basically having pseudoachalasia. You can see the time barium here, side shot with an entire column of barium. Uh, you know, this happens rarely as well with a Nissen, but, uh, you know, you can induce new motility disorders after a Lynx device, um, as far as I can tell. We took the device out, it took her about seven or eight months to have her motility return to normal. Uh, with still ongoing reflux and, and really now very sort of gun shy about even having a partial fundification because she's worried what will happen. Uh, and, and then this was a, uh, a patient of mine as well who uh, I, I asked around with the other link surgeons and uh, whether or not gastric motility has been affected and gastroparesis is there. I, I don't know what the incidence is. This device is in a good position. His surgery was uncomplicated. Yet at, at nine months he showed up with nausea, vomiting, and uh, this big food bezoar in the stomach, a gastric emptying study which is abnormal. Um, we recommended he have the links removed, uh, pyloroplasty and conversion uh, to a Nissen. Uh, so far he has uh, refused all of that. So I, I don't have anything to tell you about how to manage this, but I, I do know that I've, I've seen it. And uh, I've seen it from another link surgeon as well, wondering what we should do about this. But this is also uh, unreported in the literature, but certainly uh, has been seen as far as I, can, as far as I know. And then this is a patient who showed up for his five-year follow-up uh, in, our, in our protocol, who post-op, you can see on the left, at one year looked good. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, a two and three years, but did develop gastroenteritis after being in, uh, in Mexico, uh, vomited uh, horrendously for several days, showed up with new symptoms, and you can see now his Lynx device is now above the diaphragm and in his chest, and uh, fortunately he's responded to some PPIs, but these things do occur uh, in life. Fortunately, most of this stuff is uncommon, uh, and, um, and, and they usually happens in the first two years. Dysphagia and GERD are the most common symptoms to, to, to highlight failure of the Lynx device. Uh, erosion is uncommon and usually treated endoscopically, but certainly like my co-speakers, my co I think new, new symptoms demand evaluation and uh, further thought process about what to do with these folks. Thanks. Stay up here.